College Algebra Chapter 4, Section 4, Functions Defined by Powers and Roots. Okay, a function f given by f of x equals x to the b, where b is a constant, is a power function. If b equals 1 over n for some integer greater than or equal to 2, then f is a root function given by f of x equals x to the 1 over n, or equivalently by f of x equals the nth root of x. Okay, what this is saying is that first of all, a power function is just very simply x to a power. That's all it is. If that power happens to be a fraction, um, and they say that the denominator has to be greater than or equal to 2, if it's a fraction over 1, it's not really a fraction. It's a whole number. So if you have a fraction for the power, then actually remember that a fractional power is just a root. Uh, x to the one-half is the same as the square root of x. x to the one-third is the cube root of x. Now it says f of x equals x to the p over q, where p over q is in lowest terms. In other words, here we've got x to a fractional power, and that fraction um, has been reduced to lowest terms. A couple of facts. If q, if the denominator is odd, the domain is all real numbers. However, if the denominator is even, the domain is all non-negative real numbers. Uh, think about this, it makes sense. We just said that um, a fractional power indicates a root. When you have a number other than one on the numerator of the fraction, then you actually have a power and a root. The bottom number indicates the root. For odd roots, you can take the odd root of a negative number. For example, the cube root of negative eight is negative two because negative two times negative two times negative two is negative eight. However, the square root of negative four is imaginary and we're not dealing with imaginary numbers right now. So if you have a square root or a fourth root or a sixth root and even root, then you do not want uh, x to be a negative number. It can be zero or positive, but not negative. These are some common power functions that you might run into. We have the square root, the cube root, and then the last one there is one you're probably not as familiar with, and that is the cube root squared. In other words, you're taking the cube root of x and then squaring that result. All right, let's practice this a little bit. We're going to graph some of these power functions. Uh, you're going to graph f of x equals x to the b for b is 0.3, then 1, and then 1.7. Uh, in other words, what you're going to do in your calculator is you're going to first graph x to the 0.3, and then you're going to graph x to the first, and you're going to graph x to the 1.7 power. Pause the recording, give this a try, and resume the recording to check your answer. Hey, there they are, all three of them. You'll notice that x to the first is a line. That should not be a big surprise. Uh, x to the 0.3 is the lower curve, and then x to the 1.7 is the faster curve. And what they want you to see here is that the larger that power is, the greater the y value or the faster the y value will increase. Example, you're going to simplify each expression by hand. It might help to rewrite it as an actual root to a power. Rewrite A as you see B written. Uh, don't do these on your calculator. Instead, break them down and do them by hand. Pause the recording, give it a try, and resume the recording to check your answer. Okay, so for part A, you can see that we have the fourth root of 16 to the third power. You can actually do whichever you prefer first, either the power or the root. Uh, in this case, it's easier to do the root because the, the fourth root of 16 is 2, and then you can raise 2 to the third power and get 8. Part B, you want to go ahead and take the cube root first, and you get negative 4, and that to the fourth power is 256. Again, you could, you could do the fourth power first, do the negative 64 to the fourth power, and then take the cube root, but especially when you're doing it by hand, it makes a lot more sense to take the root first when you can. Okay, now we're going to do an example. Uh, we're actually going to use our calculator and do some regression. We've done this before. You have a table that lists the weight, W, and the wingspan, L, for the birds of a particular species. They want you to use the power regression feature on your calculator to model the data. 
um, and it will be in the form of L equals A times W to the B. Graph the data and the equation and then approximate the wingspan for a bird weighing 3.2 kilograms. So how we're going to do this is you're going to uh, hit the stat button and then edit and you're going to in list 1 put the weight that's going to be your X list 0.5, 1.5, 2.0, 2.5 and 3.0 and then list 2 is going to be the length in meters so go ahead and put those lists in once you have put the lists in then you're going to um, go back to your stat but instead of edit this time you're going to go uh, to the calculate function and you're going to um, choose power regression on your calculator and what that looks like is let's see it is actually letter A in the menu and it's PWR REG so you're going to select power regression and then to get the equation you just hit enter and then enter again that'll give you the equation uh, to graph the data what you want to do is hit second then Y equals and you will hit enter for plot one. You should have everything set up from the times we've done this before. Uh, list one will be your X, list two will be your Y. Uh, once you've turned that on, then you want to hit zoom and you want to use uh, zoom nine, which is zoom stat, which will create the perfect window for your data. And you can also go ahead and put the equation into Y1 at the same time and it'll graph everything there for you. And once you have that, you can use the graph to estimate the weight of uh, the wingspan of the bird that weighs 3.2 kilograms. All right, give that a try. Pause the recording while you're doing it and then resume the recording to see how you did. All right, so here you see uh, putting the weight in list one, that'll be your X, and the length in list two for your Y. And then you choose calculate and the power regression then you get an equation and it is 0.9674036486 times x to the 0.332591132 and you can graph as I explained earlier both the equation and the data and you see that there and then if a bird weighs 3.2 kilograms uh, there's a couple ways you can do this um, probably the easiest way one of the easiest ways uh, is to go calculate and then value and uh, it'll ask you what X is and type in 3.2 you can do that and that'll give you the answer which should be um, about 1.42 meters okay, here's a little uh, function capsule for a root function when the root is an even root the domain is 0 to infinity and the range is 0 to infinity as well you can see uh, a couple of them are graphed there, x, uh, the square root of x, the fourth root of x, and the sixth root of x, and then you have the table. Uh, the graph is continually increasing, and it is continuous on its domain. This is the uh, function capsule for an odd root. The domain will be all real numbers, as will the range and uh, it will be increasing over the entire domain and will be continuous over the entire domain. So, I want you to find the domain of each function. Give this a try, pause the recording while you do it, resume the recording to see how you did. Okay, for part A, uh, we have an even root here, so we need 4x plus 12 to be greater than or equal to 0. So, set 4x plus 12 greater than or equal to 0, and solve for x, and we get that x must be greater than or equal to negative 3. In interval notation, you're going to have a squared off bracket, negative 3, comma, infinity, and close with a parenthesis. Part b is very simple. You have an odd root, so the domain is all real numbers. Now we're going to think back to what we did in chapter 1 and explain how the graph of y equals the square root of 4x plus 12 can be obtained from the graph of y equals square root of x. Think about what multiplying a number to the x means. Think about what adding a number to the x means. Pause the recording, give it a try, and resume the recording to check your answer. Alright, so what's going on here is we can actually factor out the 4 and 
uh, this kind of makes it a little bit easier. If you factor out the 4, you can pull the 4 all the way out, take the square root of 4, you get 2. So you have 2 times the square root of x plus 3. What that means is this is going to be a vertical stretch of 2, and it's going to be a shift left 3 units. It's a very similar problem. Um, give this a try. Just think about what we did on the last one, and you should be not have really any problem on getting this one. So give it a try, pause the recording, and then resume to check your answer. Okay, again, so what we're going to do is we're going to factor out the negative 8. The cube root of negative 8 is negative 2, so that lets us pull that all the way out front. So we've got three things going on here. We're shifting the graph right one unit. We are stretching it vertically by a factor of 2, and we are reflecting it across the x-axis. And the equation of a circle centered at the origin with radius r is found by finding the distance from the origin to a point on the circle. So r is x minus 0 squared plus y minus 0 squared. We're just using the distance formula. And using that, we get the formula for the equation of a circle, which is r squared equals x squared plus y squared. This should be really familiar. We did this in both Algebra 2 and in Algebra 3. Um, when we did conic sections in Algebra 2 and in Algebra 3, we actually do it at the beginning of the year before we ever hit conic sections. There's our equation, and there's our circle. And the circle is not a function. It fails the vertical line test. So what we've really got, we've got a semicircle on top, another on the bottom. Uh, each half by themselves would be a function, but together the entire circle is not. If you remember, graphing a circle is pretty easy. Um, all you need to do is find the center and the radius, and then you just count out the radius from the center and connect it into a Now, if you solve the equation for y, so if you want to graph this in your calculator, what you need to do is take the equation of the circle and solve for y. Of course, you're going to have to take the square root. And remember, when we take a square root to get rid of a square, we always put a plus or minus in front. When you graph this, you cannot graph plus or minus. So what you have to do is y1 will be the positive square root of r squared minus x squared, and y2 will be the negative. So, and uh, notice something here, y2 is negative y1. So really what it is, it's the reflection across the x-axis of that top half of the circle. So you're going to use a calculator in function mode. So now you actually have permission to use your calculator to graph this circle. Remember, you need to solve for y to do that. Pause the recording, give it a try, and resume to check your answer. All right, so what you're going to graph is the square root of 4 minus x squared and negative square root of 4 minus x squared in the same window. Uh, they make a little note here that graphs may not connect when you don't use a decimal window or when you use a non-decimal window. So if you choose uh, zoom decimal, you will see the, the circle connect very nicely. Other um, modes of zoom won't do that. We're also going to use this to graph horizontal parabolas, and we did these um, again when we talked about conic sections last year. So we're going to sketch a graph of x equals y squared minus 1, and is this graph um, a function? Now again, you need to solve for y, and it's going to be much like what we did for the circle. So pause the recording, give it a try, and resume the recording to see how you did. Okay, now actually they did it by hand here. If you're doing it on your calculator, you need to solve for y, and you're going to have a positive and a negative. So again, like the circle, you're going to be graphing two equations. Here they graphed it by hand, and they picked some points to do that. Um, if you look at the parabola, is it a function? No, it is not, because it fails the vertical line test. And let's try this one. We're going to graph this parabola. Oh my goodness, this is much more complicated. And it's axis of symmetry, and they gave us a window to do that. Remember what this window means is you've got negative 2 for your x min and your positive 8 for your x max, your negative 4 for your y min, and your positive 2 for your y max. 
Um, in order to graph this, what you're going to actually have to do is uh, complete the square. So give this recording a pause and give it a try and then resume to see how you did. All right, like I said, you're going to have to complete the square here. So the first thing you do is you divide everything by 2. That gives you y squared plus 3y plus 5 halves. Then we're going to subtract the 5 halves from both sides, and we get y squared plus 3y. And then we're going to take half of 3 and square it. So 3 over 2 squared is 9 fourths. That gets added to both sides. So now we have, after combining like terms, on the left we have x over 2 minus 1 fourth. And on the right, we have y plus 3 halves squared. And then really, you don't need to make it any more, uh, combine it anymore unless you just really want to. From here, take the square root of both sides. So you have plus or minus the square root of x over 2 minus 1 fourth. And then subtract 3 halves from both sides. And then you could put this straight into your calculator if you choose to, um, which would be wise since they gave you a window. And here's what the parabola is going to look like in your calculator. So this is some extra practice. Pause the recording as you go through these and then resume the recording to check your answer. Continue this way until the end of the recording.